A lot of these experiments are now done with technology that has emerged in the last couple of years where we can record hundreds, in fact, thousands of neurons at the same time. The topic of today is from neurons to consciousness, and that's a weird topic to talk about, to be perfectly honest. Because if you go online and you Google consciousness, what you find is typically things like this. And I'm not going to talk about any of these things. I'm not going to talk about psychedelics, about meditation, about religion, spirituality. Uh, that is not what I mean by consciousness. In fact, uh, if you go to my colleagues, uh, some of them might uh, think about this in terms of consciousness. Working memory, attention, behavior, all of these things, again, not interesting for me when I talk about consciousness. When I mean consciousness, I actually mean something much more uh, banal and uh, pedestrian. I mean that you, at some point last night, were gone. You were completely gone. It was the same as coma or anesthesia. You were not existing subjectively in this world. Now, that might have been interrupted by dream sleep, and then eventually this happened. You woke up, and so now here you are, and you are experiencing the world. And by that, I mean that you can hear my voice, you can see me in front of you, you can see these slides, you can maybe smell the room, you can feel the clothes on your skin. And that is different f uh, between you and that laser point that, my, that I have in my hand, or the slide screen that is being projected on, or the table, uh, the chair that you sit on, anything else in the physical universe, with the, maybe the exception of animals, does not have that, that they can hear and see and experience things subjectively. So you have that for that little period that you are alive, and yes, it's gonna end at some point, but for this time period, you're not just part of the universe, you're experiencing it. And so that is what I mean by conscious experience. So uh, the simplest case of that would be that I would just show you the color of red. And you just see red. There's nothing else in your consciousness, just red, redness. That is what I mean by, by consciousness, because that is something that seems to be unique to us, and maybe some animals, that other things in the universe don't have. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem, as I hope I can convince you. There's practical problems, there's ethical problems. So for example, there's a practical problem. When we undergo major surgery, we do not want to be conscious. We do not want to feel pain. We do not want to listen to the doctors talk about what they see in our insides. So of course, we have general anesthesia. And what you believe is that that takes away your consciousness. So you, it's just like the sleep that I said, you go out of consciousness and then you come back when everything is over. Well, what if I told you that because we do not know much about consciousness, let alone how the brain relates to consciousness, this right here can actually be problematic. I took this figure from a research paper on what we call intraoperative awareness. So what does that mean? It means that there are people that we know, it's a small fraction, but we know they're not unconscious doing surgery. They're conscious. Now you might say, oh, I've heard about our colleagues over at the law school, and they're just waiting for something like this. That's a great lawsuit. Well, they give you drugs during anesthesia that makes you forget everything that happens. We call that retrograde amnesia. That's just part of some of the an anesthetic drugs themselves, and also something that you like to add, because if you come out, we extubate, and we hit the, the gag reflex, we don't want you to remember that when the hospital calls two weeks later and asks what the experience has been like. So you might be fully aware, fully conscious, uh, and lie there during surgery, and there's nothing you can do. The other missing piece there is that they will also give you something that if you were aware, you can't do anything because you're completely paralyzed. That is because we put a tube into your, into your trachea and we intubate you. We put oxygen in there, in and out. And we don't want you to fight that. So you're completely paralyzed, you might be fully aware and conscious. Now, we're neuroscientists. This is a big problem that I think we should be working on. We should be able to take brain measurements, take brain activity, and tell an anesthesiologist or a surgeon this person is unconscious or not and we're not fully there yet, it's a big problem. Well, related to that, of course, there's big political debates about human development. Well, the truth is, there too, we do not know when consciousness starts. So, another uh, practical uh, consideration that also goes uh, right here into the ethical. Now, of course, 
This also means we do not know, as I said, if animals are conscious, which animals are conscious. The only thing that you know for sure is that you are conscious. You might even know that maybe I'm a Terminator coming from the future and I'm just a robot that's unconscious, but I seem conscious. You know you're conscious. We do not know where in evolution consciousness started. The biggest thing that our brain does, this conscious experience, we have no idea how it comes about from neural activity. Now lastly, this made the big news a couple of months ago. This is a Google engineer who had a chatbot at Google, was chatting away and got completely convinced that the AI that he was chatting with is conscious and actually filed a lawsuit and said that this AI is telling me, please don't turn off the machine. I'm a conscious being. You're killing me. That's the same as human death. That's literally what this AI said. And so uh, this Google engineer went out and said, I believe we've gone too far. We've now created conscious computer programs. And guess what? The media went to neuroscientists and said, can that be? What do we know about the brain that makes brains conscious? C could, it, could that be that an AI is similar enough to a brain that it's conscious? Truth is, we don't have an answer. We can't tell them. We don't know. So what is the problem here? Well, the problem is an even bigger problem. If we think about the natural sciences, if we think about physics, chemistry, biology, we can think of it as uh, a set right here. And it falls into a bigger set of what mathematics can describe. What do I mean by that? When we differentiate ourselves from the liberal arts, from the humanities, what we usually say is, with STEM, we have rigor. So we can express the laws of nature that we find with mathematics. We use statistics, we're data driven, we're hypothesis driven, and that's because we believe that the objective observable reality that we're all part of falls into this bigger reality of mathematical constructs. And it seems at first hand that when it comes to your conscious experience, what I just said, that you just see the color red or you experiencing being in love or falling out of love or being bored. All of these things don't seem to be mathematically describable. And they seem to be separate from the rest of science. Now this is something that scientists believed for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's er only very recently that we started to question that. And it's still a little bit of a taboo. And that is why I feel a little bit awkward to talk about this today. Now, the first attempt at getting away from this was pretty clever. So this is a visual illusion. Some of you might have seen it before. If not, what I would like you to do is put your eyes on the red spot. Don't move your eyes. So fix it that red spot and don't move your eyes. As long as you do that, you might see that the other two red dots, they disappear. They're gone. All of a sudden, they're gone, erased from your consciousness. If you move your eyes, you can see them again. So I never took them away. This is an inside movie. This only happens to you. If you put your eyes back there, these will disappear. And if you keep your eyes there, things will keep changing. So we call this a bistable perception because the stimulus is constant over time. As I just convinced you, just move your eyes. But your perception of seeing the red dot on or off is going back and forth. And it's t happening totally randomly. People have done a lot of research on that. Now, the ingenious idea that several scientists had is, well, what do different parts of the brain do? So if we go inside the brain and we take your favorite ephem uh, measurement, fMRI, EEG, single neurons, you name it, well, we might find brain activity that is unchanging because there is no change in the physical stimulus. What hits your eye, what gets to your brain should not change. And this kind of brain activity should be unconscious brain activity. But we should also maybe find neurons or other parts of the brain where the activity goes up and down and up and down in perfect lockstep with your perception. So now we found neural activity that's special. That neural activity is you. That neural activity is why you see red. So this neural activity was termed a neural correlate of consciousness. And it was proposed by these two gentlemen Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the double helix structure of DNA, and Christoph Koch, uh, a neuroscientist um, who's the uh, head of the Allen Institute in Seattle. They wrote a paper in Nature which changed my life. This paper was the first paper that said, we can do science on consciousness. We can do everything that I said that neuroscientists struggle to do. We can look into the brain and find out where in the brain this transition from flesh to mind happens. 
And so their proposal, why they got it in Nature, well, one, of course, is that uh, he got the Nobel Prize and maybe had the biggest discovery in science of the century. But they also came up with a very concrete idea. So they said that the visual system in primates, such as us humans, uh, is hierarchical. So you might know that the light hits the retina in the back of your eyes. There's a bunch of neurons there. And the eye is output only. So the output of the eye, the optic nerve, hits the middle of your brain. We call that the LGN. And the LGN, then these LGN neurons, they project to the first part of your cer uh, cerebrum. That is the primary visual cortex. The, um, because it's the first visual cortex, we call it V1. And from V1, this activity spreads forward towards the frontal part of your brain. That all happens within a couple of milliseconds after light hits your eye. Well, here's what. Christoph and Francis proposed. They said what I just told you, that there's a difference between conscious and unconscious brain activity should happen right there. So that's a testable hypothesis. And why did they say that? Well, they had two reasons to say that. The first reason is that when you were dreaming last night, you had your eyes closed, there was no light hitting the back of your eyes, but you were seeing things, weren't you? So that means that in order to see, you do not need your eyes. So we can cross those out. They're unconscious. The consciousness happens later in your brain. You can convince yourself, if you're, if you're not convinced at this point, you can close your eyes and I say, Brad Pitt, and you can see him right in front of you. He's not in the room. You can see without things in your eyes. That's counterintuitive, but it shows you that it takes more to see. Now, they also propose, and this was very controversial. In fact, that still is more than 20 years later, that the primary visual cortex is also, just like your eye, not involved in consciousness. And that was I a hypothesis where people immediately went after. And so here's three colleagues of ours. Um, Jeffrey Schall, who was a professor here at Vanderbilt until very recently, Nikos Logothetis, and David Leopold. Um, those two were my PhD supervisors. And that is work by David Leopold that got me to join their lab. So what they're showing right here each of these single lines is an action potential that was recorded from a neuron in the visual cortex. And what you can see superimposed, and so it, the time goes left to right. And so we do it again and again and again, as we usually do in science. So these are just repetitions. And what you can see in shading, and then with the L and R below, that is two levers, a left lever and a right lever. And those levers were indicating, I see the red dot or I don't see the red dot. So the question is, OK, so how does this neuron respond? And you can see that this neuron right here, whenever the left lever was pulled for I see the red dot, you can see that that neuron tended to be more active. Whereas if the uh, other lever was pulled, it wasn't quite as active. And if you average this activity, then what you find is that if you average all of the action potentials around the time of pulling the lever for I see the red dot, the activity of the neuron increases. And if you do the inverse, the activity almost goes to zero. So also note that the activity increases before the lever gets pulled, saying, I see the red dot. That makes sense. You would have to first see it, and then reaction time kicks in before you can say, I see it now. So this neuron right here, if you, wa if you want, is a mind reader neuron. If you get this one neuron, you can, with a pretty high probability, tell what goes on in the consciousness of the subject that we're recording this neuron from. So that was spectacular uh, about 20 years ago. So that in itself, of course, was published in Science. And then there were papers in Nature. And I'm just going to give you a quick summary of several decades of research that followed. So this right here is the primate brain. And the back of the brain is here. The eye would be right there. You can see the primary visual cortex V1. And then what I said, the activity sweeps forward uh, from the primary visual cortex. And people have looked at all of these areas and looked, are there any neurons that correlate with that? And then fMRI studies were done, uh, including here at Vanderbilt by our colleagues, uh, Professor Frank Tong and Professor Randolph Blake. And uh, the long and, uh, uh, story here is that, yes, Basically, we do find neural correlates of consciousness. There are different neurons, there are different brain areas, and we can measure the activity, and we can predict 
what happens in the consciousness of these subjects. And in fact, we can take it a step further if you're not convinced yet, and we can, once we find that there are neurons that say uh, uh, when they get active, it has something to do with how you see a face, well, let's put in an electrode and do the opposite. Let's run some current in there and tickle these neurons, get them a little active. And so if you do that, then you get these effects. So this right here is a patient that um, is in the hospital for severe epilepsy. And uh, this right here is almost uh, well, like a, a, a head cast because there are electrodes going from the outside into the brain of this poor patient who agreed to be on here and de-anonymized. And that's because you do not want to cut out as much of the brain as you can if somebody has epilepsy because we just said that certain parts of your brain have something to do with your consciousness. So you don't want to cut out the part that's responsible for language or here goes your favorite memory or your personality. You only want to cut out the part that is sick, the part that has epilepsy. So for that what you do is you put in these big electrodes and you try to get these patients to have a seizure. And then you know exactly where the seizure started, that's what you cut out. But these patients, they don't have a seizure all the time so you have to wait days sometimes until the seizure happens. So they sit in the hospital, researchers come, come in and they can do these crazy experiments. So what you will see in a moment is that the researchers are running in currents into the brain of the patient and activating some of these neurons. First, it's a sham. So it's a control. We're not actually running the, uh, the current and then we'll do it. The patient does not know the difference. Just look at my face and tell me what happens when I do this, all right? One, two, three. Nothing. Okay. I'm going to do it one more time. Look at my face. One, two, three. You just turned into somebody else. Tell me Your about face it. metamorphosed. Your nose got saggy, went to the left. You almost looked like somebody I'd seen before, but something different. That was a trip. So what you see here is that these neurons, they do, they do not just correlate with our uh, perception, our subjective experience, our consciousness. They seem to be directly linked. If you activate these neurons, you're changing your consciousness. Now this might not blow you away because neuro, you're neuroscientists. I mean that is probably has been your assumption all along. This research on neural correlates of consciousness, I argue, has reached its peak, has reached its heyday, and in fact, I ran a PubMed search the other day about all of the publications that have neurocorrelates of consciousness in their title, and then you can see that around 2010, this is where we had most of the publications, and there's a pretty steep fall off right after. Now, is that bad news? I will, for the rest of today's talk, show you that I don't think it's bad news at all. In fact, something really exciting and amazing has happened, and I want to share that with you. So, what is the problem here? Well, when uh, Francis Crick and Christoph Koch started talking about neurocorrelates of consciousness in the 80s and 90s, that time wasn't quite right. So they were very humble and modest by calling these data, these activities that we find, correlates of consciousness. You can see that what they're basically saying is, we're not saying it's causing consciousness. All we can do as scientists is we can correlate. We can only tell you it correlates. So when these neurons are active, you feel love. It's a correlate. So you're not insulting anybody who might have strong feelings about their soul and their connection to the brain. Now the problem with that is that the word correlate um, is usually used in science in a way that we think that there's a causal relation, but we can't really get at that causal relation. And you might have heard that before, that all that physics can do is show that there's a correlation. Each time you hit a billiard ball at the pool table, the ball moves. We believe that's causal, but there's no math to show causality. We just show it correlates every single time. Maybe at some point somebody does it and the ball doesn't move. So we should always be humble and talk about correlation. The problem is that we're assuming that there's causality here. And that, I believe, has been misleading. I do not believe that brain activity causes consciousness. I believe that brain activity is consciousness. So by calling it a correlate, we've cut ourselves a little short and we started looking for things that might not even exist. And so what's exciting right here, and we can expand that maybe it's not just um, spikes of a certain neuron as I showed you, but it is actually something more complicated, networked activity. Uh, 
synchronicity between neurons, something that we're now as neuroscientists getting more and more interested in, and it's these processes that are actually identical to consciousness. And the reason I find this interesting is that I just snuck something in here, this. If there's identity, we should have an equation. That's it. And why is that exciting? Well, science at its core is all about equations. So I put a spatial scale here, and the different disciplines in STEM that we usually follow, these are the most important equations. In fact, if you ask a physicist, uh, somebody who is especially interested maybe in the philosophy of all, they will tell you, yeah, probably these equations in total, they can explain the entire universe. We can explain quantum physics, how things happen at the smallest scale. We can explain how this laser point pointer works, how light works, how the internet works, how this camera works with Maxwell's equations. We can explain temperature. We can explain how the uh, light moves from the sun, why light of other stars get spent around the sun with Einstein's theory of relativity, and it all boils down to a bunch of equations. The only thing that seems to be sticking out is consciousness. And so what I'm going to argue today is we should have equations that allow us to plug in brain activity on the one side, and we should get consciousness out on the other side. And those exist. So this right here is what I will talk about for the rest of today's lecture. It is called integrated information theory. It's not just one equation, it's a whole bunch of equations. And you might find them overwhelming at first, but uh, just give me a couple more minutes and I will walk you right through it. These equations do exactly what I just said. You can take your brain activity, your favorite brain measurement, plug it in, and it gives you the output consciousness. What that means, I will tell you in a moment, now, typically, when I present that, I get two objections. The first objection is, and I'm going to preempt it now, oh, it's just one theory. Aren't there other theories about consciousness? Yes, there are many, many, many theories about consciousness. So this right here is a recent paper in Nature Review Neuroscience, and this is just a selection of theories about brain and consciousness. But what I'm doing here is I'm showing you, do any of those have equations that translate brain activity into conscious experience? And it's no, 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 yes. There's only one. That's the one I just showed you. So that's a problem. If we have competing scientific theories and only one is using math, only one is formalized and uses notation, it's very hard to have a level playing field with other theories. Imagine we would go back and try to do quantum physics or uh, theory of relativity without equations. Once you have equations, the only thing that can really compete is math, is other theories with equations. So what I'm telling you is if your favorite theory is somewhere here, please work on formalizing it so that we also get equations and then we can start comparing these theories. Because in the end, it all boils down to math. So here's a famous quote by Johannes Kepler, one of the, the, the astronomers that help us understand that the Earth moves around the sun. And he said, the chief of all investigations of the external world, that's what we do as scientists, isn't it? Should be to discover the rational order and harmony revealed to us in the language of mathematics. And that is a term he stole from Galileo Galilei. Because he was the first one who said, the book of nature lies open in front of us as scientists, but it's written in mathematics. Because in the end, we can reduce every field of research down to mathematics. Sociology is really just the combined psychology of different people. Psychology, we as neuroscientists believe, is really just brain activity. Brain activity is really just biology, which is really just complex organic chemistry, which is really just quantum physics, which is really just mathematics. The last objection that I usually get about this theory of consciousness is, who, who came up with this theory and why? Well, I can tell you the theory uh, the person who came up with is called Giulio Tononi, who's a researcher at Wisconsin. But if you ask him how and why, he tells a very interesting different story. He tells you the story of Rene Descartes. Rene Descartes lived more than 400 years ago, and he lived in a time of crisis. He lived through a time of very rapid intellectual development, political systems collapsed, and philosophy, which had been seen secure and solid since the time of the ancient Greeks, was increasingly questioned. And so Descartes' response was, OK, I can't trust anything anymore. What can I trust? And so he started doing something that some of us do when we hit puberty, we just question everything. And he realized that if you question everything, there's one thing that you can't question, which is, that you're there and questioning. 
So that is this famous cogito ergo sumo, I think, therefore I am. He realized if, in fact, he should have said, I doubt, therefore I am, but somebody had it said before him, and that would have been too close giving it away. So this is where integrated information theory starts as well. So the starting point is the Cartesian, the Descartian point of saying, I question everything. In fact, I don't believe any of you exist. I might be an eel living on another planet, and this is just a dream. I might wake up tomorrow and realize that was a crazy dream. But if I question all of that, I can't deny that this dream exists, so I must exist. What else can I find out if I doubt everything? Well, as I said, the first thing is that things exist. The second one is that things are informative. What do we mean by informative? Well, right now, none of us, I hope, see a pink elephant right here in a room. So if that's the case, that's information. There's no pink elephant. There's many other things that are not in a room. That is what we mean by information. We can also, and I'm not going to uh, walk you through all five of these points, but we can say that there's, things are composed in terms of time. There's a past and a future. Uh, there's exclusion. So you don't see what's at the back of your head right now. That probably doesn't bother you maybe until I call it out right now. But your consciousness is limited in space and time and so on. So there's five uh, points or properties of consciousness that Giulio Tononi identified and that he then put in the language of mathematics. You call it in, in mathematics an axiom. So an axiom is the idea that uh, we cannot prove this. None of us can. You have to accept it. But most of us would be okay to accept that, that consciousness is limited and that consciousness has information. We don't have to prove it because we're not really questioning it. And so out of these five axioms, all of this math I, I just showed you arose. So let me expand on one of these a little bit because it's the heart of it. So let's think of a, a modern digital camera. Uh, to keep it simple, it's where you would have one megapixel sensor in the back of the camera. So of course, what do we mean by megapixels? Well, it means that you have little photodiodes all the way sitting in the back of the camera. The light falls in through the lens, and then each of them gets activated by light. And if we take a photograph, because we have uh, different light sensors, uh, we can have filters in front of them for different colors. We can reconstruct the photograph that we took. Very simple. Now, to some degree, uh, the visual system uh, uh, works similar, but there's a main difference, which is that if we would take uh, something and disrupt any communication, any electric connectivity between these different photodiodes in the back of the camera, this would still work. That's because there is no communication between these photodiodes in the back of the camera. Each of them is just collecting data and saving it on a hard disk. Well, the human brain is very different. So, of course, the human brain at first works very similarly, but what we can do in the human brain is we can also cut. And you might have heard about uh, a colossal cut. If you do this in patients, and was done a long time ago, you end up with split brain symptoms. So that used to be another way to treat epilepsy. We would just do a surgery, open the entire skull, take a scalpel, and cut the two hemispheres in part. So there's no more or almost no more communication between the two halves of your brain. Well, if you do that, you might have learned before, this happens. Now, if you ask people, and since language is only in half of the brain, what do they see when they keep their eyes still? They will perfectly describe you what they see in half of the image. So what is happening if we cut the brain in half, we cut that image in half. So that is basically why this theory is called integrated information theory. It is saying this right here is information, and the brain seems to integrate it. And the reason that you are conscious, your brain is conscious, and a camera isn't, is that it's not integrated, even though it has a lot of information. So I'm not going to go through all the axioms. I'm just telling you that once you formalize these different axioms, you can come up with these different equations that I just showed you. And all of this math, uh, in the end, boils down to taking brain activity and getting something out of it. Now, if you're still skeptical, now let me get into the empirical part, the real brain science. So once the theory was proposed, um, the first attempt of seeing whether the theory works was with experiments that were called ZAP and ZIP. So what is ZAP and ZIP? So it's a combination of TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation, and EEG, which a lot of you might be familiar with. So what we're doing is we're zapping by taking a really strong magnet and activating through the skull the brain. 
while we're also doing EEG, and then we can measure the response of that zap. That's the zip. So this we very complicated experiments, as you can imagine. The people um, uh, need to get EEG caps on. If you work with that, you know how much work that is. And then you also put on a TMS machine to uh, be able to send these very strong uh, electromagnetic pulses into the brain and see what happens. Why did they do that? Well, I just told you that the theory says that consciousness is integrated information. So if you are conscious and we're zapping your brain, what we should see is that that gets integrated. But whereas if you're unconscious, that shouldn't happen. And so the first experiments that people did was exactly this. And this is a summary of all of these experiments. And you can see that uh, there are different states. Let me walk you through these very quick. So these are healthy subjects right here in the middle, each of these dots. And they are awake, fully conscious, as hope as I hope uh, you are still right now. These right here are all interesting states. This right here is called non-REM sleep. That is the type of sleep that we tend to think no dreaming is happening. You're just gone. You're out. This right here are different anesthetics. This is what you uh, are given in general surgery. Again, you're comatose. You're out. These are interesting anesthetics. We don't use them a lot anymore. And that's because we believe that they don't really turn you unconscious. Instead, what they seem to do, we call them dissociatives. They only seem to be kick you into another form of consciousness. So in other words, you're dreaming. You're not unconscious. You're dreaming. So we can do a surgery on you because you're not, you're not coupled to the world. You're, you're in your own world. But look at this. The theory seems to work. The theory says, oh, it's almost as if you are awake. So this is the first piece of data, the first set of evidence. And lastly, this has also been used in, in different patient studies. In fact, um, it's, it's one of the techniques that we hope that we can find out if we call somebody to be in a coma, whether they really are in a coma, or maybe they can't just communicate with us. And you can see that the theory helped. With that theory, we can plug in brain activity, and we can see whether the lights are on or off. So that's very exciting. But it's indirect. So uh, you might criticize me at this point and say, I was with you the whole time. You said there's equations, we can put in numbers, we get numbers out. So this isn't it. This is just taking the theory and then making extrapolations and saying, oh, if information is integrated, then if we do SAP and SIP, we should see that the information keeps flowing around. It doesn't stay put locally at a spot. So. The next set of experiments I'm going to talk about, and that's hot off the presses that I'm quite excited about, is to actually use the math. And so a lot of these experiments are now done with uh, technology that has emerged in the last couple of years where you might have heard about this. We can record hundreds, and in fact, thousands of neurons at the same time. And since uh, the, uh, most of this work is done in mice, and their brain is about as large as your fingernail of the thumb, we can stick in six, seven, eight of these electrodes and almost get the entire brain covered. So I'm exaggerating, but the way that I call it is think fMRI, but with single cell resolution. So millisecond resolution, single neurons. So these neurons are called neuropixels. You might have heard of Elon Musk, and so he's selling them as a company that's uh, saying we're going to put these in humans. It's a huge game changer in terms of us understanding the brain. And of course, people like me who are interested in this theory, we are getting all giggity because now we can apply the math to all of these neurons. And we can compute uh, the result of the equations. And the result is a scalar. It's a single number, usually a float. And that number tells you more or less conscious. So if we run the math on all of these neuronal data, we should be able to find out, is the number going up or down? Is phi going up or down? Now, the first paper came out last year, in, in 2021. And it was done not in mice, but in a fruit fly, tiny little fruit fly. And uh, the fruit fly has something called a mushroom body, which you know, to some degree is equivalent to our brain. Uh, it is a central nervous system. And you can stick in these electrodes that record hundreds of neurons at a time. And so the uh, researchers uh, at Monash University in Australia, they did that. And then they put the uh, fly in a tiny chamber that was a lot of gas that does gas anesthesia. And guess what? The fly stops moving. So I'm not saying that I, I'm not necessarily trying to convince you that the fly is conscious and we anesthetized the fly and now it's unconscious, but it hits the bill. It fits the bill. The, the, you put a fly under 
anesthesia, and just like humans, it seems to fall asleep. It seems to be unconscious. Now, the algorithms that come with um, those equations is shown right here. And don't worry, I'm not going to walk you through all of this. But if you do neurophysiology, a lot of this might look familiar. So these are local field potentials. So those are the uh, extracellular voltage fluctuations you can measure in the brain. They go up and down as a function of time. All they did is take the mean across time. And it said, if it's above the mean, let's call this a 1. If it's below the mean, let's call it a 0. And you can see this right here. So black would be on one electrode each time we have a 1, or let's call it an up state. The brain is up. And this would be white, where the brain is a down state. It's down. So you come up with this sequence of zeros and ones as a function of time. And so what I'm showing you here is two electrodes. And then what the math does is it, uh, it computes if one of these electrodes is in a down state, what is the probability that the other electrode at the next point in time is in an up state? And also, what is the probability that it itself is an up state or down state? So you can come up with this matrix. Those of you who are familiar with Markov change might say, that's a Markov chain. That's right. This is a, we call it a transition probability matrix. We think in physics very often, this is what explains any complex system. Here is how the system is right now. And those are the probabilities given these states right now what the system will be uh, uh, next in the future. That is what we call a Markov chain. Now, what integrated information theory does next, that's the ingenious move. What we're really interested in is we want to know if that's causal, because it could be correlative. How do you know if that's causal if you can't go in the brain and change things? So what you can do is you can artificially set one channel at one state and then see what this does to the rest of the system. And so integrated information theory causes this cutting out or marginalizing or noising the effect of that, of that signal. And then you can see how does that affect all of the other probabilities that the system is now going to move into the state. So you can quantify by comparing these probability distributions with a single number how much of a causal effect this element had. And now here's the kicker. Most of the causal techniques that you heard about, they usually go pairwise. How does A affect B? How does B affect A? This doesn't stop there. You can go, how does A, B, and C affect D? How does A, B, C, and D, and E affect F? This doesn't stop. It's a multidimensional technique. And you can get multidimensional uh, causations out of it. And then the rest of it is very easy. All you do is you take the minimum of this and the maximum of that, and you end up with a single number. OK, this sounds very complicated, but it's not. And there's even better news. If you're interested in this, we got software that does it all for you. So it's downloadable, downloadable for free on GitHub. It's called PyFi. And all it does is it's asking you to put in neural data, and then it's computing all of this for you. So this is what uh, the authors did. And so what did they find? Long story short, well, I wouldn't show it to you if this wouldn't have worked, right? So they compute phi many, many times for different experiments. And then they see what happens if the fly is conscious or unconscious. And you can see that when the fly is not anesthetized, phi is higher on average than if the fly is under anesthesia. We went all the way from in the beginning of class saying consciousness is weird to just put in the neural data and you get out how much consciousness exists or not. We can also do this with humans. So since we're here in the engineering department, it's a quick uh, shout out to uh, uh, Professor Katie Chang. And so uh, Katie's lab, she's putting people in fMRI machines. She also tends to do EEG at the same time. And she's trying to find out how conscious people are. And for one uh, the, of the reasons that I told you that we really need to find out, looking at a brain, how conscious somebody is. But also, if you do fMRI, the fact that people kind of get drowsy and less drowsy is really annoying because that changes your brain data. And it might uh, mask what you're actually interested in. So Katie's idea is that she can measure how awake or conscious people are in the fMRI. And then you regress that out from your data, and you get much cleaner data, much better result. So she has done that uh, for quite a bit of years already. And she has come up with an fMRI template that she used. And she verifies that by looking at EEG. Um, because in EEG, typically, that's the gold standard. We can at least tell if people are a little bit more or less drowsy. But look, once we take the same data and we put it through these algorithms, we do much, much better. So despite all of this work that Katie did and laudable work, and under some circumstances, to be honest, this fMRI template outperforms what we're seeing. This right here on certain timescales seems to work better. 
Now, lastly, you might say, OK, so you convinced me that we need a mathematical theory. There's benefits to being formal and rigorous. And you showed that there's some empirical support for that. But if I have a theory of consciousness, what I really want to know, for example, is why is taste so different from hearing? And why does touch uh, have such a different quality to it than sight? And so that's the last part of this research that's happening on this theory where people are using the math to work this out exactly. So there are certain properties to seeing color, for example, that they are arranged in this continuous weird circle or sphere. There are certain properties to how we perceive space or time. And what these people are trying to do is to explain why things are the way they are in consciousness using this mathematics. And so that is what I wanted to share with you today. I think it's a very exciting research program. We started out saying that when we think about STEM and the sciences, we typically think of that as something that's objective, that doesn't have any space for subjective, private, first-person experience. It's an intersubjective, interpersonal task, and we do that using the rigorous language of mathematics. Well, I, I hope to convince you that maybe that's not true. Maybe when it comes to our conscious experience, it, it squarely fits into mathematics, and thus it squarely fits in, into uh, 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 science as a whole. So in fact, that is why Galileo said the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. And a fellow uh, Tennessean, uh, Eugene Wigner, one of uh, the un a little bit forgotten heroes of quantum mechanics and uh, co-inventors of the atom bomb, he called this the, probably the biggest puzzle there is. Why is it that each time we do really good science and we end up explaining things, we end up with math? So that is maybe an even bigger question that I want to leave you with. When I showed you this cartoon that I took off the internet many years ago, where neuroscientists felt when we talk about consciousness arising from the brain, it takes all of this magic. Well, in fact, I think what it really takes is just a piece of math. So thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.